Welcome everybody. Hello. Hello. I keep looking at my script like there's some kind of very intricate thing I have to say. I don't know what it is. Welcome to the uh, 2016 Liberal Arts and Sciences Interdisciplinary Conference called What You Think You Know is Wrong, Questioning Certainties. Uh, today we're going to hear from our keynote speaker, Dr. Laura Penny from King's in Halifax and many other places too. Uh, and I'm not trying to imply anything there. Uh, <laughs> but before uh, we introduce her, I just want to do some of the things you're supposed to do before you introduce the speaker. Uh, I want to thank a whole bunch of people who have been amazingly helpful both this year and in other years making this event possible. First, I'd like to thank the members of the conference committee, uh, Maria Lucia Di Placido, Mike Evans, Michelle Jordan, Aaron Landry, Shelley McCabe, Eric Mortensen, Elena Papianis, Brett Reynolds, Lisa Salem Wiseman, Alex Schwartz, Mike Wells, and Melissa Wilson for all the nice things they've done for me and for the conference this year. I also want to thank some of the people I call on my script bigwigs, uh, starting with Chris Whitaker, president of Humber College, Lori Rancourt, the senior vice president academic, Gina Antonici, uh, the associate vice president academic, Eileen DeCourcy, Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning, Paula Govea, Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences, who's really done tremendous stuff helping us and getting us lots of money and things like that, Darren Lawless, the Dean of Applied Research and Innovation, and all other unmentioned big wigs. Congratulate yourselves on your wigs. Uh, I also want to thank some of the people in uh, the LAS office who've been amazingly helpful to us with things like making web pages and getting stuff photocopied and so on. Uh, our former business manager, Cynthia Wilson, and her able uh, uh, follower, Melanie Sparks, Arl Viaggi, who did a great job with all our web stuff, Nicole Thomas conti and Amanda Phillips, who've helped us with all kinds of things, as well as Elena Tran, uh, who is the office administrator in LAS. Thanks also to Antonio Foligno and the staff of the Humber Room. They're going to give us a great lunch tomorrow. I hope you can all be there. Also to Media Services and uh, to the facility services who've helped set up the uh, dinner tonight and other things, Chartwells, thank you very much, as well as to uh, Laura Tamona, who is uh, married to Eric Mortensen and is the artist in residence for this event. She will be here tomorrow, and uh, we have several things involving her artworks. We have a silent auction of some of her work that you can check out. Eric will talk a bit about that. As well, we have a door prize draw tonight. Everyone's name is in the box, and we'll be announcing later who won a painting by her. Uh, and of course, she painted the, the picture of Laura Penny that is in your program on page two and on all the posters. So uh, just so I can remind you of some things you should know as well, I'd like to thank uh, our direct financial sponsors, both uh, Humber Liberal Arts and Sciences and the Office of Research and Innovation, as well as the, the Center for Teaching and Learning, and uh, Custom Stainless Products, who made a great donation to us. Thank you very much. And uh, to Nelson Education, and Jill back, hi. And Linnea, uh, you, it, we've received so much help and financing with this. It's been great. Uh, so I'll remind you that after the talk today, there is a reception, you, as you can see. And we'd be really keen for you to eat and drink uh, a lot, because then <laughs> we'll feel we've accomplished something in providing you with nourishing sustenance. There is the draw. Uh, and uh, if you are a delegate, you can look at the back of your name tag and you'll see a ticket, I hope. That is a free drink. Don't let it go to your head. You only get one. But if you want more, you can pay for them. That's fine. Tomorrow morning, starting at 9 in the atrium uh, near E135, we will have a breakfast service there for people. Please come in. Please eat, drink coffee, generally kibitz, and get ready for the various sessions through the day. The sessions are predominantly in the D building, D202, 203, 204. There's one session in E143, that's the nutrition and culinary session. They need the special room for that. Uh, and I'll remind you that lunch is at 1230 in the Humber Room, and there's a closing gala, incredible, fantastic display of all kinds of things, probably mostly just seeing me all sweaty and relieved, <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the Humber Room, and I hope you can be to, at all these events. I hope you have a wonderful time, and I turn it over now to Eric Mortensen to introduce our keynote speaker, Laura Penny. So Laura Penny is a writer, an academic, 
and I would say a full-time opponent of debased discourses. She teaches in contemporary studies and early modern studies programs at King's College Halifax and is the author of two Globe and Mail notable books, 2005's Your Call is Important to Us, The Truth About Bullshit, and 2010's More Money Than Brains, Why School Sucks, College is Crap, and Idiots Think They're Right. Uh, they're both published by McClellan and Stewart. Uh, she has also been called the Naomi Klein for cranky people with a sense of humor, and it's a quality I think was uh, evident in her 2005 conversation with Morley Safer in 60 Minutes. Devoted to examining the North American tendency to accept complacency, lies, and misinformation at the expense of intelligence, she ruthlessly calls out politicians, corporations, the media institutions, and the public over their lapses into bullshit and anti-intellectualism. By applying context to patterns of thinking that have been forgotten or purposefully ignored, she serves as a creator of what I would call useful complications. I'm certain that what she's presenting tonight will do the same thing, and I'm looking forward to hearing it. Please welcome me in, please join me in welcoming Laura Penny. Thank you so much. That was an exceedingly kind introduction. Um, so today, uh, the first thing I need to do is apologize, uh, partially because this is a Canadian tradition, uh, and partially because I threw my back out yesterday. Uh, this happens every now and then. Uh, several of my students laughed at me yesterday when I was quasimodoing my way into class. Uh, I'm just warning you that there may be some weird noises, there may be mild grimacing, uh, and there may be a couple of postures that look more like something from a David Lynch movie. Uh, I'm also mentioning this because Montaigne mentions this sort of thing throughout the essays, and he is definitely cool with people making weird pain noises. He writes, quote, if we play a good game, it is a small matter that we make a bad face. If the body finds relief in complaining, let it do so. If it likes agitation, let it tumble and toss at its pleasure." End quote. Montaigne goes on at length about his bouts of kidney stones, which he concedes are sudden and awful, but there are worse diseases. They make him appreciate his health between attacks, and they acquaint him with death, which he thinks of as a valuable service. He also tells us about his near death in a horse crash, his eating habits, his preferred poop time, he's a morning man, and his hatred of doctors. The vulnerability of our bodies and the inevitable deterioration of age are persistent themes throughout the essays. And to segue on over to the conference theme, the changeability and the frailty of the human body undermines, interrupts, and sometimes even mocks some of our cherished certainties. I will definitely come back to Montaigne, but first I want to thank you all for the very kind invitation and say a few words about questioning certainties. I'm delighted to be here since I think this is a terrific topic for a conference. Those of you who have endured several academic conferences know that they are often orgies of certainty production and celebrations of all the nifty things we nerds know we know. But this fondness for certainty is by no means an exclusively academic affliction. This is a people problem, a quirk or foible of our species. Certainty has much to recommend it, after all. It's efficient. Questioning demands more effort than believing or assuming we know. Certainty is reassuring. Our bedrock beliefs are as cozy and comfy as our beds at the end of a chilly and dreary day. Certainty also inspires confidence, which people seem to find incredibly compelling. Research suggests that we silly, balding monkeys tend to believe those who believe themselves. The psychologist Philip Tetlock has long studied political judgment and our ability to make predictions. His work shows that the most confident pundits prevail 
no matter how incorrect their assertions and predictions may be. Assertiveness, swagger, and certainty matter much more than accuracy. If you have ever watched a gaggle of squawking heads caw over one another on cable news, you can see how being loud, proud, and sure plays better on TV than trying to explain and nuance the complexities of a campaign or policy. People who qualify, equivocate, or point out subtleties seem like they're waffling. And waffling is bad punditry and bad TV. It's the opposite of breakfast when one should waffle often. The cognitive psychologist Daniel Kahneman says that, quote, declarations of high confidence mainly tell you that an individual has constructed a coherent story in his mind, not necessarily that the story is true, end quote. We are suckers for coherent stories. Hell, we even enjoy incoherent stories if someone delivers them with sufficient gusto. Consider one all too current example of the power of confidence. If you're a masochist and have been following our southern neighbor's interminable nightmare election, you know that Trump is a flaming orange example of the power of confidence. His preternatural self-assurance is an important part of his appeal. Though he may change his position over the course of a day, or even in a speech or run-on sentence, he always sounds certain in the moment. It doesn't matter if he's wrong as long as he looks strong. Trump's popularity suggests that certainty is a hell of a drug and that we can say and do some wild things when we are hopped up on confidence. It's not just that we love certainties. We also despise uncertainty. The Canadian writer Dan Gardner, who has recently released a book called Super Forecasting with Dr. Tetlock, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, writes about research that shows we hate uncertainty more than we hate cancer. Patients who received test results that confirmed they had cancer were more relieved than those who had to come back for further testing. It was better to know, subjects said. I think those of us who've had to wait for medical test results or the outcome of a job interview or some other big life-changing decision get this. We do not think of periods of uncertainty as blissful interludes of pre-disappointment when health and wealth are still possible. Instead, we'd rather hear the bad news ASAP. It's better to be a veritable tumor pinata or flat broke, professionally rejected, and unemployed than it is to linger in the not knowing. Now that I have bummed all of you out and filled your heads with Trump and cancer, I'd like to return to Montaigne, a dude whose work suggests our potentially pernicious addiction to certainty can be managed, if not totally beaten. Most nerds agree that Montaigne invented the essay as we know it. This is usually the part where I encourage my students to you know, shake, his, shake their fists at the author of their torture, right? Uh, of course, what's even worse about Montaigne is that the sick bastard wrote essays for fun, which always makes my students very angry. Uh, Montaigne would probably find this claim that he's the inventor of the essay embarrassingly lofty and would point to some of his classical precursors, so writers like Seneca and Plutarch. Nevertheless, the essays give us a new kind of writing, one that stakes out a strange space somewhere between biography and philosophy, but that also meanders its way through subjects that now belong to disciplines like anthropology, classics, lit crit, and psychology. Montaigne described himself as, quote, a new figure, an unpremeditated and accidental philosopher, end quote. So he never claims to be a scholar. 
he is usually quite critical of scholars, partially because he has a mor mortal horror of pedantry, uh, partially because he has a terrible memory. Uh, more importantly, he's of the opinion that we should think to live uh, rather than living to think, right? Which is the problem with all too many professional nerds. My plan today is to start with a brief sketch of Montaigne's life and then move on to his sustained critique of certainty. As the quote I chose for the title of this talk suggests, he believes that only fools are certain and assured. Then I'll say a little bit about how the process of essay writing allows Montaigne to develop what contemporary psychologists call metacognition, which is really just a fancy way of saying uh, the ability and willingness to think about our thinking. My main argument is that Montaigne's metacognition enables him to live with and in uncertainty. Moreover, it also has other salutary effects. One of the great joys of reading Montaigne is his imaginative empathy, which extends to the then recently discovered peoples of the new world, to women, and even to animals. As he famously wrote, quote, when I play with my cat, who knows if I am not a pastime to her more than she is to me, end quote. And of course, those of you who happen to be owned by cats know the answer to this question, right? I want to argue that Montaigne's empathy is a product of his epistemological humility, his attentiveness to what he knows, what he does not know, and what he cannot possibly know. So let's get to that bio I promised you. Michel de Montaigne was born in 1533 at his father's estate just outside of Bordeaux. His folks were relatively nouveau riche. His great granddad had made a lot of money in the fish and wine trade and bought a chateau that came with a noble title. His mom was from a well-off trading family of Spanish Jews, but Montaigne and his siblings were raised Catholic though a few did convert to the new Calvinist cool that was sweeping France at the time. Montaigne's dad, who he calls the best father that ever was, was well acquainted with Italian humanism and singularly devoted to his son's early education. So tiny Michel had a tutor that addressed him exclusively in Latin. The rest of the household, including his parents and the servants, learned some Latin so they could speak to tiny Michel. Uh, his dad also hired, I love this, a musician to wake him up in the morning, since, you know, a harsh wake up in the morning was thought to be, you know, inimical to the budding young humanist. Uh, he was sent away to the College de Guienne in Bordeaux from about 6 to 13, where he had a very lousy time, if his essay of education is any indication. Montaigne ended up following his father into local governance. He also spent a few years at court and visiting par Paris. The high point of his political career was meeting his dear friend, Etienne de la Boétie, who was also a politico and writer a few years older than Montaigne. De la Boétie died of a fever in 1563, and Montaigne, to his credit, stayed at his deathbed the entire time, even though doctors warned him that the fever might be contagious. He's not a big fan of doctors. Montaigne then lost his beloved father in 1568, these two deaths plunged him into an atypical bout of melancholy that spurred him to retire to his library in 1571, quote, to rest in the bosom of the learned virgins, end quote. This is when he began working on the essays and he would continue to write, to revise, and to make additions to his text until his death in 1592. There were some interruptions in his learned leisure. Uh, for example, in 1581, he went to Italy to try and bathe his kidney stones away. Uh, and the good people of Bordeaux just made him the mayor when he was out of town. Uh, 
his dad had been the mayor. They had high hopes. But still, I think this is a sign that he was kind of, you know, a decent dude, right, to get spontaneously mayored like that when you're out of town without even having to run a, run a campaign. We really do not hear much about his political career in the essays. But historical accounts do say, you know, fairly solid mayor. Uh, the one criticism is that he did apparently flee a plague once, but I am pretty confident I would also be a plague fleer, right? Uh, I don't see myself sticking around for a plague, personally. Uh, more importantly, and the thing that's really key about Montaigne, uh, is that he was one of the precious few people who could actually run interference between uh, the Catholics and the Protestants. The French Wars of Religion started when Montaigne was about 32 and continued until he died. So living in the midst of a raging religious controversy slash civil war is undoubtedly part of the reason why he consistently champions moderation, deliberation, and is so critical of our love of certainty. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about his life at the end, uh, but now, since Tempest is fugiting as it does, I'd like to get into his work and talk about his criticisms of our foolish certitude. There are two factors that are wor at work here, one which we can attribute to nature and another that is nurture. The first is that man is born to presume. He writes, quote, Presumption is our natural and original malady. The most vulnerable and frail of all creatures is man, and at the same time, the most arrogant. He feels and sees himself lodged here among the mire and dung of the world, nailed and riveted to the worst, the deadest, and the most stagnant point of the universe. On the lowest story of the house, I'm the farthest from the vault of heaven. And in his imagination, he goes planting himself above the circle of the moon and bringing the sky down beneath his feet. It is by the vanity of this same imagination that he equals himself to God, attributes to himself divine characteristics, picks himself out, and separates himself from the horde of other creatures." End quote. I'll come back to presumption in a moment and we'll stay there for a while, but first I'd like to mention the second of the two factors that conspire to make us certain and foolish. This is custom, which he intends in both the sense of a set of cultural assumptions as well as our habits. Custom, Montaigne argues, shapes us as mama bears lick their cubs into bear form. He writes in an early essay called Of Custom, quote, the principal effect of the power of custom is to seize and ensnare us in such a way that it is hardly within our power to get ourselves back out of its grip and return into ourselves to reflect and reason about its ordinances. In truth, because we drink them with our milk from birth, and because the face of the world presents itself in this aspect to our first view, it seems that we are born on condition of following this course. And the common notions we find in credit around us seem to be the universal and natural ones. Whence it comes to pass that what is off the hinges of custom, people believe to be off the hinges of reason. God knows how unreasonably most of the time, end quote. In a later essay, Montaigne returns to this theme and compares custom to Circe's drink, an allusion to that moment in the Odyssey when the witch's brew turns Odysseus's doomed crew into pigs. Another of the joys of reading Montaigne's essays is his reveling in the diversity and variety of human customs. He is very interested in the differences between various European cultures, right, and the fact that Germans drink their wine like this and the French drink their wine like that. And he is even more interested in the differences between Europeans and the indigenous peoples of the New World. In essays such as Of Cannibals and Of Coaches, he tends to valorize New Worlders as more natural 
more robust and more honest than their scheming mercenary European colonizers. We also see this theme in the essay of custom, which I quoted a moment ago, where he writes, quote, habituation puts to sleep the eye of our judgment. Barbarians are no more marvelous to us than we are to them, nor for better causes, as everyone would admit. As everyone would admit if he knew how, after perusing these new examples, to reflect on his own and compare them sanely. Human reason is a tincture infused in about equal strength in all our opinions and ways, whatever their form. Infinite in substance, infinite in diversity, end quote. So Montaigne repeatedly argues throughout the essays <coughs> uh, that we all tend to think our own cultures and customs are the best because they're the ones we know. And they are also the ones that have determined the way we know and see the world. So we Canadians have grown accustomed to things like milk and bags, ketchup chips, and apologizing for everything. I can assure you that most Americans find these phenomena kind of weird, maybe endearingly so, but still weird. Uh, and our cultures share a fair amount of overlap. Uh, once when I was in grad school in America, I was hanging out with these two guys from South Carolina and I started to notice that they kept making me repeat certain words. Uh, so I'd say boat or out or house. Uh, and they'd be like, what was that? Right? Can you say that again? They were laughing at my accent. I found this pretty rich and creamy considering the cultural connotations that attach themselves to a southern drawl. But the main point I want to make here is that everyone has an accent, but people from our hometowns talk normally, which is to say, in the style to which we have become accustomed, right? Um, talking normal, my favorite bad line from a student paper is, why can't Shakespeare just write normal? burned into my brain. I'll be forgetting my own family members and that'll still be there. Uh, so what Montaigne is doing here, right, is he's encouraging us to be mindful of the effects of custom so that we can avoid becoming utterly encased in our own. So having fleshed out his critique of custom, I'd like to loop back to presumption, our natural and original malady, which I left dangling a few minutes ago. Claiming that humans are vain and proud is not really a newsflash, right? It's an idea as old as Ecclesiastes and arguably even way older than that. So Gilgamesh, right, the star of the eponymous, extremely ancient epic, wants to make a glorious name for himself, like an author, an athlete, or a rapper. And he also tries to cheat death. Right, like some of Silicon Valley's more hubristic moguls are currently trying to do. Uh, I don't know if you saw this this summer, but libertarian billionaire Peter Thiel has been enthusing about the life extending possibilities of parabiosis. Uh, parabiosis is being injected with the blood of the young. We already have a word for that. They're called vampires, right? Uh, I digress though, let's get back to Montaigne. Uh, presumption can take a couple of forms, one of which uh, is assuming we have absolute or certain knowledge, particularly of God, right? Because don't forget that people are butchering each other in Montaigne's general neighborhood over, you know, the precedence of faith over works and other things that we do not find as war worthy anymore. Uh, or the other thing that presumption can refer to here is our fondness for our own judgments. In the essay of presumption, Montaigne maintains that there are two parts to this particular kind of vainglory. We overestimate ourselves and we underestimate others. One form of this vainglory is believing we have certain or complete knowledge of God, which Montaigne thinks is impossible. 
we wildly overestimate our capacities and vastly underestimate the divine when we claim to know his will. Again, Montaigne stayed Catholic, and he said that he stayed where God put him, otherwise he would not know how to avoid endlessly rolling, which is not exactly the most rousing argument in favor of the papacy. Uh, but he generally does accept the church's teaching and keeps religion off stage for the vast majority of the essays. Still, he is writing in the midst of a period of bloody, protracted religious warfare. So he is repeatedly, explicitly critical of those who are cruel or violent in the alleged service of God. So, for example, he argues that the ritual cannibalism of the New World is far less vile than all the hideous tortures Europeans visited upon living bodies in the Old and New Worlds in the name of decency and religion. Montaigne suggests that there is a link between certainty and cruelty, and cruelty is the only thing he hates more than presumption. When we presume we know God's will and are doing his work, we give ourselves permission to do vicious things like torturing or killing others. Zeal causes far more bloodshed and suffering than questioning or skepticism, right? You don't see a lot of ambivalent suicide bombers, right? This kind of violent zeal is the most extreme and destructive form of presumption. The more mundane, everyday form of presumption is our profound affection for our own judgments. He writes, quote, I think my opinions are good and sound, but who does not think as much of his, end quote. We may be able to recognize and acknowledge that other people are prettier, taller, or richer than us. But Montaigne insists that it is very difficult for us to escape the feeling that we are right, that our opinions are the best or the most rational. He writes, quote, there never was a porter or a silly woman who did not think they had enough sense to take care of themselves. We readily acknowledge in others an advantage in courage, in bodily strength, in experience, in agility, in beauty, but an advantage in judgment we yield to no one. And the arguments that come from simple natural reasoning in others, we think we would have found if we had merely glanced in that direction." End quote. In a later essay of The Art of Discussion, he reiterates this point in much more vulgar terms, bumming a quote from Erasmus. Quote, every man likes the smell of his own dung. Our eyes see nothing behind us. A hundred times a day we make fun of ourselves and the person of our neighbor and detest in others the defects that are more clearly in ourselves and wonder at them with prodigious impudence and heedlessness, end quote. So our presumption blinds us in two ways. We don't see the flaws in our own opinions or judgments, and we are keen to point out those self-same flaws when others pull the same dung we do. This is a good example of us simultaneously overestimating ourselves and underestimating others. It also shows that we do not know ourselves nearly as well as we think we do. I'll come back to the importance of self-criticism and self-analysis in a moment when I get to some of the practical tips scattered throughout Montaigne's essays that can help us manage our propensity for presumption. First though, let's finish dealing with his critique of it. Presumption keeps us ignorant of and isolated from others and creates a distorted picture of the self. The latter is a serious problem since the self is one of the few things Montaigne thinks we can manage. We can't control the flux of the world, but we can work on the way we respond and react to it. But this must commence with a robust understanding of our natural inclinations and abilities 
and our customary baggage. Montaigne repeatedly insists throughout the essays that he is trying to create an accurate self-portrait rather than a flattering one. In the introductory address to the reader, he says that he would show himself fully naked, like the peoples of the New World, if Europeans were not such prudes. So to put this in contemporary terms, he's trying to capture himself without filters or Photoshop. And presumption is a filter, a rose-colored mirror that gives us a false sense of the self and its capacities. The other thing that Montaigne finds deeply irritating about presumption is that it seems to inspire unwarranted confidence, the certainty and assurance of the fool. He writes, quote, Nothing vexes me so much in stupidity as the fact that it is better pleased with itself than any reason can reasonably be. It is unfortunate that wisdom forbids you to be satisfied with yourself and trust yourself and always sends you away discontented and diffident, whereas opinionativeness and heedlessness fill their hosts with rejoicing and assurance." End quote. I mean, surely most of you have heard the old saw about playing chess with a pigeon, right? Don't play chess with a pigeon. It will knock over the pieces, shit on the board, and then strut around like it won. So st stupidity here, right, is a kind of self-satisfaction, right? The acceptance of a heedless opinion as certain. There's a notion in contemporary psychology that echoes Montaigne's argument here. The Dunning-Kruger effect was first proposed by Dun Dunning and Kruger in a popular psychology paper published in 1999 called, quote, unskilled and unaware of it. There they note that competence and confidence are in an inverse relationship to each other. People who generally do well at a task often underestimate their performance, while those who do not do as well remain blissfully unaware that they have done badly. So a good student will remonstrate themselves for getting a B plus or an A minus because they know what an A assignment looks like. Conversely, someone pulling C's and D's may blame the teacher, the subject, or walk away from a test they totally bombed, claiming that they nailed it. There's also a cultural thing here. Uh, Dunning and Kruger and Dunning and a bunch of other people have done follow-up research on this and have discovered this is kind of a North American phenomenon, right? It may have something to do with our insistence on healthy self-esteem regardless of skills or merits. Um, feel free to chide me about that later. Uh, so yes, uh, to get back to the actual text here, uh, Dunning and Kruger argue that it takes the same skills to judge a good performance as it does to give one. Consequently, as Montaigne argues, the fool will be confident satisfied with their performance because they don't know the difference between a good job and a bad one, an accurate idea and some presumptuous nonsense. Meanwhile, the competent consistently question their performance, which is part of the reason why they are competent. Some people, like the comedian John Cleese, have summarized the Dunning-Kruger effect as, quote, stupid people have no idea how stupid they are, end quote which is not entirely in the spirit of the research, but still. The key thing that I want to emphasize here is that certainty, assurance, being pleased with our own performances are all inimical to accurately assessing ourselves and improving ourselves. For Montaigne, reasoning our way to wisdom is an endless process. Thinking is rethinking and writing is rewriting, as we see in his persistent practice of adding clarifications and elaborations to the text of the essays. The mind, like some breeds of shark, must keep on moving or it dies. Stupidity or presumptive certainty is a dead shark. 
Estultifying self-satisfaction that bars our access to the flux within and the flux without. The fact that we and the world are always changing. Montaigne's arguments against presumption are partially influenced by Catholic doctrine, which of course insists that pride is the wellspring of all sins. But we also see the influence of classical thought in his writing on presumption insofar as Montaigne advocates for a skeptical suspension of judgment. We need to deliberate, to think comparatively and critically before we rush to a particular conclusion or opinion. This is not easy since custom and presumption are compelling and convenient and deliberation demands effort. We don't need to exercise our skepticism about every judgment, Montaigne admits, as we would starve or at the very least drive our loved ones bats if we put every judgment on pause. But we should be self-critical and deliberate about judging when it comes to ethical situations or the things that really matter to us. So how do we check ourselves before we wreck ourselves to quote the philosopher Ice Cube? <laughs> I think there are pragmatic strategies, both explicit and implicit, braided through the massive bulk of the essays. The first is the kind of sustained self-analysis we see in the essays. Now, of course, I'm assuming most of you are not French noblemen. Any French noblemen? No, didn't think so. Uh, you may not have a library in a tower that you can repair to, nor do you have a capable wife to run your estate. I mean, you may have a capable wife. I'm just guessing you don't have an estate. <laughs> Uh, you probably do not have time to devote yourself to essays grade self-exploration. Uh, my preferred translation, which is Donald Frames, clocks in at 857 pages, which is really beaucoup de moi, 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 moi. As Montaigne famously wrote, quote, I study myself. That is my physics. That is my metaphysics, end quote. He also describes himself as like rolling around in, in himself like a kitten in catnip, right? And some of you might be saying, well, big deal, so does Kanye West, right? Who cares? Uh, but I want to argue here that Montaigne is emphatically not a narcissist and that there's nothing like self-analysis to slap the narcissism out of you. First, he insists that we need to consider ourselves in relation to the world and ponder other customs and opinions to truly understand our own. He writes, quote, this great world is the mirror in which we must look at ourselves to recognize ourselves from the proper angle. In short, I want it to be the book of my student. So many humors, judgments, opinions, laws, and customs teach us to judge sanely of our own and teach our judgment to recognize its own imperfection and natural weakness, which is no small lesson, end quote. The narcissist mistakes their world for the world. Montaigne is too curious and pluralist to do that. Learning about other cultures, be they distant in time or in space, is his idea of fun, but it's also good advice to acquaint oneself with other cultures, both to get some perspective on one's own and to recognize that your culture is a culture instead of the way things should be, what's natural or normal or universal. For Montaigne, the only universals we really experience in this life are diversity and change. And the sooner we learn to embrace, appreciate, and even enjoy those things, the more likely we are to avoid tumbling into foolish certainty. Second, a sustained consideration of what we really know and where we got that knowledge, be that from books, experience, or sheer presumption, is the best way to rid ourselves of the sense that our dung uniquely does not stink. It takes Montaigne years of reading and living and writing and rewriting to get to know himself, to become, as he jokes, the world's leading expert in Michel de Montaigne's studies. Again, you may not have time to crank out three volumes of mostly delightful prose, 
but it's still a valuable exercise to record or scribble one's thoughts, to give an external form and expression to the clamor within, to get another perspective on the self. Inventorying and documenting our thoughts, however fleeting, borrowed, or insipid they may prove to be, allows us to track how our minds change over time, to identify our patterns, and to think about our thinking. In one of the very first essays, number six, on idleness, Montaigne writes about sitting down to write. Instead of just churning out an argument or idea, he was disappointed to discover that his mind just wandered all over the damn place. Comparing his mind to a plot of, quote, wild and useless weeds, end quote, as well as a runaway horse, he tells us his thinking, quote, gives birth to so many chimeras and fantastic monsters, one after another, without order or purpose, that in order to contemplate their ineptitude and strangeness at my pleasure, I have begun to put them in writing, hoping in time to make my mind ashamed of itself, end quote. So there are a couple of things that I think are really cool in this passage. First, he describes a situation I think most of us have enjoyed at one point or another, right? You sit down at your keyboard, charged with purpose, only to have your thoughts completely unravel the minute you try to type them. Second, he's showing us that externalizing our thoughts or even just being mindful of and attentive to them defamiliarizes them, makes them strange and monstrous to us. Third, he highlights his ineptitude, which is the first step to developing aptitude. As he says in another essay, ignorance that knows itself is not complete ignorance. The truly ignorant are confident that they know. Finally, he realizes that shaming his mind will be a process that requires patience and time. We encounter a slightly more sophisticated and spatialized version of this metacognitive process in another essay called Of Solitude. There he writes, quote, we must reserve a back shop all our own, entirely free, in which to establish our real liberty and our principal retreat and solitude. Here, our ordinary conversation must be between us and ourselves and so private that no outside association or communication can find a place. We have a soul that can be turned upon itself. It can keep itself company. It has the means to attack and the means to defend, the means to receive and the means to give. Let us not fear that in this solitude we shall stagnate in a tedious idleness." End quote. Here Montaigne is proposing a dynamic and dialogic self, one which goes beyond the metacognitive moves of the last passage I quoted all the way to a model of the self as its own friend, its own interrogator and interlocutor. In another essay of The Art of Discussion, Montaigne tells us that he prefers conversations with people who give him a hard time, who question him, who help him think something he did not before, who challenge and test his opinions, which helps him determine whether they are well-founded. But it is clear in this passage and at other points in the essays that we can also perform the useful service of squabbling internally for ourselves. To bring this back to questioning certainties, most of us could probably stand to do a little more squabbling with ourselves. And now that everybody has a phone, no one's going to think you're crazy, right? So just think you're on a Bluetooth. Part of the reason why we do not know ourselves is that we think we know ourselves. So we don't bother to question our opinions or judgments. It's easy to assume that you know you since you're stuck with you all the time. But as Montaigne writes in On Experience, the glorious final essay of the essays, quote, the fact that each man sees himself as satisfactorily analyzed and as sufficiently expert on the subject are signs that nobody understands anything whatsoever about it, end quote. 
Engaging in a more combative and critical friendship with ourselves is the work of a lifetime, but it can, at the very least, enliven our idleness. And at best, it helps us combat our tendency to flail to foolish certainties. Montaigne thinks that this is the point of philosophy, to better equip us to be happy, to be kind, to enjoy those great gifts that God and the world have to offer. He opposes it to those philosophies, primarily medieval scholasticism, which of course everybody in the Renaissance is yelling at, right? Uh, that spur us on to lofty heights. Rather than a spur to our presumption, philosophy should be a curb. It should help us escape our immersion in the foolish certainty, custom, and presumption encourage. He writes, quote, philosophy seems to me never to have such an easy game as when she combats our presumption and vanity, when she honestly admits her uncertainty, weakness, and ignorance. It seems to me the nursing mother of the falsest opinions, public and private, is the overgood opinion man has of himself, end quote. So to give you one last kind of contemporary example here, uh, Julia Galef uh, gave a TED talk this summer called Why You Think You're Right Even If You're Wrong, which seems pretty on topic given the conference's theme. There she contrasts two mindsets, those of the soldier and of the scout. The soldier uses what Galef calls motivated reasoning. They want to attack, to defend, they want to advance ideas that feel like allies and destroy those that seem like enemies. Conversely, scout mindset is about being open and merely seeks to understand. Scouts, Gallif argues, are curious and able to change their minds without having a complete ego meltdown about it. She ends her talk with a question. Do you want to defend your beliefs? Or do you want to see the world as clearly as you can? In keeping with Montaigne's critique of presumption, it's clear our immediate impulse is to do the former. But with practice and deliberation, some self-shaming and some self-befriending, we can curb or at the very least recognize and correct for this urge. Even though we long for foolish certainty, this ultimately only puts us at odds with our ever-changing world and our deteriorating selves. I will let the man himself have the last word here. Quote, I who boast of, I who boast of embracing the pleasures of life so assiduously and so particularly, find in them, when I look at them thus minutely, virtually nothing but wind. But what of it? We are all wind. And even the wind, more wisely than we, loves to make a noise and move about and is content with its own functions without wishing for stability and solidity, qualities that do not belong to it. Thank you very much. Are people say, hungry? <laughs> people can eat and ask questions. I just wanted to say, yeah, people can eat and ask questions. That's yeah. true. But uh, if you do want to ask a question, now is the time to ask a question. We're very excited for you to ask a question. We're almost like panicking. You won't ask a question. <laughs> We're hoping that you uh, will use the microphone in the center of the room so that people on other campuses and watching the webcast can also hear your question. Because it's probably a very good question. So share it with everyone by speaking into the microphone. So please feel free. Just ask a question. Anytime. Go right ahead. Oh. Yay. No, no. It looked oh. like he was going to ask a question. <laughs> I got so excited. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. So you got to speak in the Yes, of course. I'll break the ice. Thank you uh, kindly. <laughs> uh, wonderful talk. Thank you so much oh, for that. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet of you to um, say. <laughs> my question is, and, yeah. and, and it's not just your talk that has me ask you this question, it's daily life. occurrences. <laughs> it's life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I admittedly, I love this topic and in uh, and, and the names that you mentioned as well. Um, my question is, what is the traje trajectory here? Yeah. Um, are, we, are we getting worse 
oh. as human beings, even, you know, oh. we, <laughs> where are we at? Um, you know, your point about the students, for instance, I, yeah. I, I share a story where inevitably every year a student will come to me and say, I can't believe I failed. <laughs> and, and and I look, and I look through. I the, find this very plausible. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I look, I look through their marks. Yeah. They missed three of six assignments. Yeah, yeah, they yep. failed both tests, and they bombed the final. And in my immediate thought is, I can't believe you thought you passed. Yeah, this is a weird kind um, of paradox of teaching. But but it, in general, though, are we? Do we have hope here? <laughs> Um, or is the information age actually making this worse? So okay. that's my question. Excellent question. Um, two things. First of all, I think this is the great paradox of teaching, right? Like the students who hang around in my office and, you know, can't chase me down enough even when I'm walking around like a hunchback. Uh, those are always the students who are doing pretty well, right? I'm sure it's the same in your case, right? It's the ones who are doing poorly. Uh, never come see me and are probably somewhere out there being like, Fleur Petty's a bitch, that's why I have a bad grade, <laughs> right? Um, which is fine. Uh, so I do feel like, like I discovered the Dunning-Kruger effect uh, right after they rolled out Sarah Palin. Uh, and now she seems like a scholar and a gentlewoman compared to, you know, the tangerine fascist. Uh, I don't know if the internet is making everything worse. I actually teach a class uh, called Masses to Memes, which is really delightful for me because we start with you know early 20th century mass media and we take it all the way up to you know what's happening on their phones now. And one of the things that's really delightful about this class is that the kids are way more square and, and disappointed in the world than I am, right? That they're like, the internet's making everybody insensitive and stupid. And I'm like, you could put the phone down, right? <laughs> um, no, I can't, but it's the worst, right? <laughs> um, so I do think one kind of side of the fact of the internet that uh, certainly a lot of people in the cognitive crowd that I'm kind of gesturing here at, uh, one thing they talk about is that the internet is confirmation bias on steroids, right? So uh, what you get on the internet are echo chambers that flatter your pre-existing beliefs. Uh, you get more and more of a gap between beliefs, between even news sources, right? Uh, so it becomes increasingly difficult to have a civilized conversation about just about anything. Uh, because again, both sides are so polarized and are dependent on their own infospheres that, that never ever seem to overlap with each other, right? Um, so I don't know, like I'm certainly getting dumber with each passing year, but I don't know that I can speak for all of humanity. Uh, and I do want to be wary, right? It's very easy to conflate your own precipitous decline with the world, right? Like this is what most cultural critics have been doing for quite some time, right? I don't get this anymore. Clearly, this is terrible. Um, but I do think that, that there are some aspects of internet discourse that have kind of coarsened, right? Our ability to talk to each other. I think that's kind of a problem. Uh, certainly more than one person has said that Trump is basically a comment section that has come to life, right? Uh, several people have said that. I can't take credit for that one. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know. I mean, on the one hand, we have so much more information present to hand. But if you don't have good judgment, then that's not super helpful would be what I would say there. But thank you, that's a super depressing question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been putting off taking muscle relaxants all day, so I'm really looking forward to taking a handful of them and thinking about that, thank you. Hi there, hey. thank you for your talk. Hey, my pleasure. Um, so I have a question. When yeah. I, I'm teaching, whenever I teach an intro philosophy class, yeah. like, I'm always trying to steer my students between, on the one hand, absolutism with certainties, and on the yeah. other side, relativism, yeah. and complete skepticism, yeah. or what I've been teaching the, the Phaedo this week, and, oh, uh, cool. and Socrates calls misology, the complete mistrust of any argument. Yeah. 
So you take on certainties. Yeah. But when you say there are no certainties, you've just asserted a certainty. Of course. So clearly there are certainties somewhere or yeah. there's something going on. What keeps the complete slide yeah. into complete skepticism, complete yeah. relativism, all that sort of thing, and how yeah. do you navigate that? Yeah, okay, this is an excellent question. Um, well, I'll give you what I think Montaigne's answer would be here, right? Um, first of all, Montaigne uh, kind of dismisses the possibility of being a total skeptic about everything, right? If you're a total skeptic about everything, you'd still be somewhere in your childhood, like milk or juice, I'm so thirsty, right? Um, that making choices is kind of exhausting, Right, there's a delightful book by a guy named Barry Schwartz called The Paradox of Choice, which is all about how, uh, you know, going into the gap and seeing a hundred different kinds of genes actually just makes you miserable, <laughs> right? That if they only had two pairs of genes, you'd be much more confident about your genes, and plus you blew a lot of brain power standing in front of the gene display at the gap, right? That this is cognitively exhausting to live in a world with so many, like, flavors of toothpaste and energy drinks, right? Um, I seem to have wandered away from the topic. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the things that Montaigne holds to be certain are, first of all, he's sure there's a God and that the Catholic Church is probably right about it. Uh, second, uh, he's sure that cruelty is always repulsive and bad, and particularly bad when uh, it's in the name of colonization or visited on animals or visited on women, right? So uh, I do think there's a couple of ethical precepts that he wants to hang on to that partially are informed by his reading and partially are informed by his experience, right? Uh, so I don't think it's realistic to claim that we can like toss all the certainties, right? That way lies nihilism, basically. Uh, and uh, I also just don't think that's how human brains work, right? I mean, again, a lot of this cognitive stuff will argue that uh, the subconscious mind is just kind of running at conclusions and the conscious mind is basically just doing PR for it, right? Uh, that we're just rationalizing things that our guts are kind of leading us to do, right? So I don't think you'll ever get rid of all of the certainties. I mean, I guess maybe a good kind of rule here would be the more radiant with smugness you feel about something, the more you should think about it. Maybe. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's a good feeling, right? Like, I felt a little bad when I was writing Trump jokes, because part of me feels like this is like making Hitler jokes in 1933. Uh, but part of me couldn't help it, because I think he's totally egregious and a great example of confidence gone horribly awry. Right? Um, yeah. Please do. Um, I love your talk. Oh, thank you. That's very sweet of you to say. I love the way you talk, too. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I get like, a lot of complaints for this no, weird I love voice. The style. <laughs> I love the style. I really, I really enjoy it. Um, I teach writing. Oh. And you said something that made me really think. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to squabble it in public. Because yeah, all my please. Friends. I don't need to have a friend of myself. <laughs> Yo, you brought a posse. Um, Great. But yeah. <laughs> uh, they check myself when I wreck myself. Excellent. Right? So, yeah, there That's we go. true friendship. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I teach writing, and students are very uncomfortable with Absolutely. their writing. They're this, I teach the course that is their least favorite course at Humber College. Um, and <laughs> the good news is that they actually have to take two writing courses at Humber College, so, but then they find the love at the end. But I really like this idea of writing, and I don't know if you said it or if I took the note down, but yeah. the idea that writing reveals our ignorance. Yeah. And when you see that ignorance in writing, it's not real ignorance anymore. It becomes a bit of insight, a bit of wisdom. Um, I'm interested pedagogically and even just teacher experience. How yeah. do you teach students to become more comfortable with their ignorance on paper? Oh, this is an excellent question. Um, one thing I try to do in class is, I don't even have to try to do this, frankly. I say a lot of ridiculous shit. I want to make sure that they don't say the stupidest thing that anyone's heard in class that day, right? That's my job, right? <laughs> 
um, because I want them to be comfortable, right? Uh, I want them to be able to digress. I want them to be able to improvise. Uh, and sometimes that means making an arse of myself, frankly. Um, in terms of writing, on the one hand, our students are doing more writing than ever, right? Like the vast majority of their social lives are written now, which is really strange, right? Um, on the other hand, they do have this weird kind of reluctance about writing because they feel like they don't have something to say, right? And I just don't think that's true. Um, I think the hard part with students is convincing them that editing is the only thing that makes writing good and that patience is the only way you get good editing, right? I do find students get pretty quickly frustrated with the fact that everything sucks when you first type it, right? Um, so I think a lot of it is about just giving them the patience uh, to stay with the process, right? Because I don't think a first draft of anything is much good. <laughs> I don't feel like I totally answered your question there. Oh, really? Yay me. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it's not easy for people who are like 17 to 20 something, right, to have patience, right? I mean, you know, I made a lot of jokes about being decrepit and broken, uh, but it's vastly preferable to being young. Right? Like, I think we've all forgotten how difficult being young is. Having all your emotions, like, jacked up to 11, right, is no way to live your life, right? <laughs> um, and so patience is hard for them. Like, they want to sit down and just, you know, bang out something great on a first draft, and you have to tell them that that just ain't how it works, right? In your uh, forays into empirical psychology, have you ever come across um, any <laughs> coherent account of, um, you know, why we seem to be hardwired this way to yeah. um, miss overestimate ourselves to yeah. quote George Bush? Uh, yeah, I pl mean, pl please don't tell me it's just the people who brag a lot get laid the most, and that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you get into this stuff, you get a lot of like evolutionary kind of just so stories, right? Like that the person who sat in a bush and was like, is it a tiger? I don't know. I should look this up. Got eaten by a fucking tiger, right? <laughs> um, whereas, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, live stream people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, whereas of course, right, the person who hesitates uh, or the person who's just like, uh, tiger, right, is more likely to live and pass on their dunderheaded genes to another, right, generation of dunderheads and so on and so on and so on. Um, I mean, look, I think this is because, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows this in their very marrow bones, uh, thinking is hard hard and it's not always fun right and it's not always comfortable and it's certainly not always flattering if you're doing it right right uh the thinking requires like actual you know energy right and and inconvenience in a way that assuming manifestly does not right um plus you know thinking can be kind of a buzzkill Right? That thinking can be kind of wet blankety, right? Um, that you can be a real party pooper with your thinking, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd say part of it is the fact that, uh, you know, the dumb did prevail evolutionarily, right? Uh, but part of it is that thinking is not really natural or pleasant. Right, that it's effortful, right. So uh, you will paraphrase the great philosopher Ice T. Yeah. So I th I thought. Ice Cube. Oh, I dude. thought it was Ice T. <laughs> 
Don't well, step to my hip hop game. Sorry. <laughs> So what I wanted to do is yeah. uh, was just watching another. Uh, I'll paraphrase another great yeah, philosopher, um, Anthony Bourdain. Okay. Yeah, and uh, he was having an interesting conversation with uh, Barack Obama while they were having uh, dinner in Vietnam, and the conversation was about this similar topic, about how we basically have two sides of the coin in the yep. U.S. Right? We have the side represented by Trump. Yep. Half of the U.S. or however eh, much it is, hopefully 30%. Let's say 30, 40, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, who are, you know, on the certainty side. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. know what needs to be. Yeah. And then we have the other side, which is questioning, which yeah. is educated, which is, right? Sure. Uh, and what's your prediction of what the future holds? Oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> and no, no. So this is what he asked Obama. And Obama said, okay, I'm good. up. Okay, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Obama said, I'm optimistic. I think that, and this is what Bourdain was trying to stress, if more people mm -hmm. did the questioning, like you said, mm -hmm. and took the trips to Vietnam mm -hmm. and realized that the people in Vietnam mm -hmm. are not that much different from them, mm -hmm. they eat the same, mm -hmm. you know, they you know, they have different mm -hmm. foods, but yeah. they all want to eat, they yeah, want to yeah, feed yeah. their family. Yeah. So Obama was saying, I'm optimistic that if yeah. more people go in that direction and question themselves and view other cultures, it'll change. So the, my question is, in a sense, to you, yeah. uh, taking to finish off my long-winded question. Um, remember, looking at the debate between Clinton, uh, Clinton, uh, Clinton and uh, Trump. I try yeah, not yeah, to say yeah. it, yeah. Uh, but but one was a perfect question to illustrate this, and it was the question about uh, police relations with the black community. Oh, good lord! And <laughs> so You're making you, me relive it. I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. So the Clinton response was the questioning response. So yep. what do we do about this? Well, we have to go into the community. We have to yep. ask them what they think is best. Yep. Then we have to work at community policing. Absolutely, then we have yep. to look at this, this, that. Right. And Trump's response was, oh, the answer to that is simple. It's law and order. Yeah. Right? And we had the same issue here when we had Harper mm -hmm. right, and Trudeau. It's the same thing. What do we do about the crime problem? Harper, simple. Mm -hmm. Law and order, yep. that's the way it should be. And I don't need all these criminologists and professors yep. telling me what should be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. So my question to you is, in a sense, uh, don't want to predict the future, but what do you think about sure. that? Yeah, what is there, if we go to the side of being, are you optimistic about, you know, if we start questioning certainties and go on that side, mm -hmm. that that's the way forward? Mm -hmm. Or are we looking more at a world where, we're sort of leaning maybe towards the other side. Okay, cool. This is an excellent Sorry, question. No, no, no. It's an academic conference. I would feel disappointed if I didn't get one of those. Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean that affectionately, of course. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, I do think uh, I do think Canada and America are significantly different in this one way, which is that America is the land of great extremes, right? That you have, you know, the smartest people and the not smartest people, right? Uh, you have, you know, some of the world's greatest universities and NASCAR, right? Like, oh, keep turning left. That's a sport. Uh, and uh, I do think in some ways we're America's excluded middle, right? Like if you ask a Canadian, they can be an Irving, they can be a hobo, they're still going to claim to be middle class, right? That uh, Canada kind of places a premium on a wishy-washy centrism that seems to have been completely driven out of America, at least for the time being, right? So that'd be the first thing I'd say about that is that there is a difference. Uh, the other thing I'd say here, and I never thought I was gonna do this, good Lord. Uh, I loathed Stephen Harper with the intensity of a thousand burning suns, but I never, he was never a fascist. Right? Like, he had some principles. They weren't my favorite principles. He wasn't horribly effective at implementing them. Uh, but he did have, you know, a code, right? Uh, Trump is a fascist. Like, if you look at 
what Walter Benjamin has to say about fascism, about it being about giving people a kind of means of expression without changing their economic situation or their political power, right? The Trump is textbook that. And he has literally no ideas that are consistent, that it's just every day is a new salad of horrible assertions, right? Uh, so I hope that, and I feel super, super bad, right? I have a lot of friends in America because I went to grad school there and I just can't, I can't, like, I watch this like you would watch hockey, but they're in this and this is what their kids are going to have to live with. I feel so sorry for them. Uh, I'm hopeful that shame will prevail. I'm hopeful that a lot of people will turn out just because they don't want to be embarrassed in front of the rest of the world. Like, that's not super optimistic, but that's <laughs> the kind of optimism I can muster, right? Uh, that people will just not want to contribute to negative stereotypes of America by electing, you know, if Las Vegas were a person, right? Shame 2016. Yes, shame 2016. <laughs> I would vote for shame every four years. You know, you can take the girl out of Vatican City, but you can't get all the Vatican City out of the girl, right? So, hey. Hi, I'm, I've, the question I've got, uh, yeah. talking about the idea of education as yeah. sort of the goal to try to understand, the attempt to understand yeah, is yeah, yeah. one of the motivations. I'm interested in what you think is a way that we can communicate that to parents, to students, to the mm. culture at large, because it mm. seems very much for education now, the culture has moved it towards use value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and how we combat that to try and alter it. Oh, good question. Um, a couple of things. First of all, there's a great quote by Marshall McLuhan where he says that the problem with a cheap specialized education is that you never stop paying for it, right? That I think one of the things we adults do with depressing regularity is tell the kids, hey, everybody, be a pharmacist. Be a pharmacist. That's a sure thing. Be a pharmacist, right? Well, right now, there is a glut of pharmacists in America, which seems unbelievable given the amount of pills they're going to require to get through the rest of this election. <laughs> uh, or, you know, this has also happened uh, in law, right? That for years, we told our little liberal arts kids, right? Like, oh, you know, like, memorize these things, and then eventually you will get a job, right? So I do think that it's definitely a kind of fool's errand to act like, oh yeah, I know what jobs are going to be around in 10 years. Really? Like anybody who makes those kind of projections I think is kind of full of horse shit, right? Like I don't know, like in 10 years the best job could be like bullet farmer in our Mad Max hellscape, right? <laughs> like we don't know, right? Uh, that, like even when I was in college there was no internet. And within 10 years, you know, I had friends who were making ridiculous amounts of money technical writing or friends who, you know, gone into coding and whatnot, right? Like, I think we are really, really bad at predicting the future. Uh, and so oftentimes when we tell kids, like, oh, this is a sure bet, then we're just creating a self-defeating prophecy, right? Uh, you're also creating a kind of uh, incentive to study something you don't give a shit about to make a buck. Fair enough, right? But uh, that makes me worry about the bridges of the future, the hospitals I'm going to inevitably, right? Uh, that if we encourage this kind of hardcore mercenary attitude towards education, uh, it doesn't have its intended results, right? It ends up just distorting the job market. Uh, and it also means that we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of, you know, creating a professional class of people who don't actually want to be there, right? So, I don't know. I mean... One of the things I love about teaching, and this is going to sound deeply weird, is that I don't do anything. 
mind. Don't ever. Hi, president of Kings. You never heard me say that. Um, <laughs> but when I say I don't do anything, like let me tell you a tiny story to illustrate this. Uh, so a couple of years ago when Occupy was happening, there was an Occupy group over at Dow that I knew some students in and I wanted to go donate some money. Uh, so I gave them some money so they could buy soup and stuff. Uh, and as I was on my way back from, you know, seeing these ragtag, ragingly lefty students who were filled with, you know, adorable young person zeal, right? Uh, I ran into another one of my former students who was working for Vic Tays, the then justice minister. Yeah. And we had, you know, a good spirited discussion about the costs of crime, right? He's like, crime costs Canadians $2 billion a year. I'm like, that's terrible. Why are you spending $10 billion on prisons to fix that, right? Like, I don't understand, right? Very nice young man. I thought he was wrong about everything, but we had a civil spirited conversation about it. Uh, and I remember walking back to my office being like, I don't do jack shit, right? That some of them turn out to be, you know, uh, Occupy kids. Another handful of them go work for Stephen Harper, right? That uh, in a way, uh, if you're doing this right, you're helping them figure out how to shame and befriend themselves. Right, that you're helping them identify, right, what their actual inclinations and aptitudes might be. That you're giving them the kind of space to figure that out for themselves, right? Because of course, there are all these cultural imperatives, right? And all these things saying, you know, you'll never get a job, right? Uh, that, you know, you're gonna starve under an underpass if you study something you care about, right? And that has nothing to do with your major, everything to do with boomers. <laughs> um, that's one of those easy explanations we all enjoy. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, for me, I think it's about helping them find out what they might be good at, what they might actually enjoy. The other thing I've started telling people besides, if you like stuff, don't go to grad school. Uh, <laughs> is uh, have a couple of things, right? Like I think it's just a fact that we still comport ourselves as though, you know, you graduate from high school, you go to Imperial Widgets, you do your 50 years there, they give you a gold watch, farewell, you know, you spend the rest of your life driving a mobile home around North America. Like nobody lives like that anymore, right? That economy, however much it may linger in fantasy is gone. Right, that most of them are gonna have to do five or six different things over the course of their adult lives. So never, ever, ever commit to just one thing, right? Always have, you know, a backup plan and then another backup plan so that you're a little more flexible. Huh? Yeah, please, don't be shy. Nobody's given me a swift kick in the arse, even though I figured this talk, like somebody would oh. be like, all right then, right? You no, we, th we think you're bang on. That's <laughs> oh no! <laughs> uh, uh. Um, I too teach writing, but also editing. So I'm tweeting you as Sister we go. Woman. Oh. Yes, I'm, I am tweeting you as we go, and I'm Ooh. hoping my students are watching. I'm also a recent King's grad. No way! Yes. J school? No. Okay. The new MFA program. Oh yeah, J school, sorry. Not even. Well, oh. it is the J school, but yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. We digress. Yes, we do. I <laughs> was, uh, I was, I just love your piece about shaming your brain. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how many things you've been writing, but that does happen. It's, it is universal. Yeah. How do you unshame your brain to get yourself started? Who? Um, deadlines help. Uh, <laughs> When people, uh, when you don't want to disappoint people, that's that's a good impetus to writing, right? I don't know if that works for men, but it certainly works for women. Uh, ooh, nobody likes the sexism joke. Uh, ouch. Uh, yeah. Uh,
it is to shame brain. Uh, I think that it's uh, always difficult to, there's a great, great uh, thing that the painter Francis Bacon says, right? Where he's like, you don't face anything so, ha so hospitable as a blank canvas, right? that you look at the kind of cursor blinking and you think, oh, this is a blank page, but it's not, right? What you're actually doing battle with is all of the bad writing that has ever existed and all the kind of cliches that you just absorbed, right? By virtue of existing in North America, right? Like all the kind of horrible verbiage. And I mean, you guys work at a university, right? You get the emails, right? The endless emails, oh, good Lord. Um, if we actually had any of the things in this email, you wouldn't have to send me this email a thousand times, right? Um, so yeah, I do think that uh, we don't face anything so welcoming as a kind of blank when we try to write, right? That on the one hand, you're facing all the kind of bad language that you just consume in the run of a day, right? This is doubly true if you're reading a lot of student work. No offense, kids, right? <laughs> Um, and, uh, you're also on the other side, or at least for me, like, I can't write near my bookshelf because I feel, like, puny and wrong, <laughs> right? Like, I'm teaching Lolita next week, and the fact that English is Nabokov's, like, fourth or fifth language makes me want to hurl myself off a bridge, <laughs> right? Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that anyone who is trying to write is going to have to wrestle with, on the one hand, the impossibility of ever doing it as well as the people we admire, right? Uh, and on the other hand, with all the kind of bad language that you're just kind of soaking in all the time, right? I don't know how helpful that was practically. That felt more like an existential cry than <laughs> good advice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird thing to do, right? Like we were talking about this last week in one of my classes and like, you know, cause we were doing Don Quixote a while ago and it was just like, isn't reading weird kids, right? Like reading's weird, right? And, and that, you know, you would stare at just pulp and hallucinate for hours at a time is a strange <laughs> thing to do, right? And it's a fun thing to talk about with Don Quixote, right? Because the question I'm always asking them is like, is he the best reader because he tries to live it? Or does that make him the worst reader because that is absolutely not the point of reading, right? So uh, I guess the thing I'd say here is that writing is weird, right? That other species do things like use tools or make art or mourn their dead, right? I don't know, please tell me if you do. Do other species write, or are we the only idiots who? Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of us more fictus than others, right? Yeah, seriously, I'm happy to take it. Don't let the like wriggling. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> absolutely. Like, this is actually distracting me from my pain, so thank you all. <laughs> the best medicine is appearing in public. Uh, Jen, hi. Hi. So I was going to build on Paul's question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> you made a choice in the yeah. way you read Montaigne, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's certainly one of the readings that you were giving is he's challenging certainty. Yeah. Therefore, he's privileging uncertainty. Yeah. It seems like he's a skeptic. Yeah. A relativist. Yeah. Values diversity. Yeah. But in fact, that's not Montaigne, right? He also says, uh, as you quoted, yeah. I am both by physics and metaphysics. Yeah. All contradictory statements are affirmative yeah, statements. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right? There is a whole kind of defense of, of God. Yeah, for sure. Um, thinking is hard, writing is hard. Yeah. But if Paul hadn't asked this question and it ended at that point, I think most of us would not know that who haven't read Montaigne. So my question is, why make that decision to, if not read him as a skeptic, yeah. and a relativist, at least yeah. to give the impression 
to those who haven't read Montaigne, yeah. that he, he's again a skeptic, challenging medieval theology. Well, was. I mean, I think this depends on which interpretation you take, right? Like, I didn't hide the God stuff, right? I mean, well, only, only, yeah. only when you ask the question. No, right? the God's in the paper, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the question then becomes, what is God, right? And and since there isn't that questioning or interrogation. Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that he does do, and this is in the Apology for Raymond Sebond, right, is he takes essentially the fideist position, right, which right. is that we're too benighted to adequately understand God. So I'm, you know, going to stay with the original and best, right? I'm going to stick with Catholicism. Uh, but I'm going to mention it hardly ever in the rest of this book, right? which I think is partially due to, uh, again, him not wanting to compromise his position as someone who could talk to Catholics and Protestants, because mm -hmm. there were certainly not enough of those people kicking around. Uh, what I do want to say, though, I do read Montaigne as a relativist, but I want to qualify that, because mm -hmm. I think relativism gets a bum rap, right? I think most people think of relativism, and they just think of, like, shrug emoji. Right. right, like whatever, right? Nothing's better than anything else, right? And I really don't think that's his position, No. right? No, I sorry. think that he's a rigorous relativist, and this is why I mentioned the shark image, right? That in On Experience, he says, you know, our end is not in this world, which is further evidence of his, you know, God having, right? Uh, our inquiries in this world are endless, he says. Right, that our ends in the next world, but here we're not going to be able to settle on anything because we're changing, the world's changing. Oh, look, a tooth just fell out of my head. Thank goodness I am dying in pieces so I can handle it. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, I do think he's a relativist, and you know, there's some fancy French people who are in my side, so <laughs> I'm not going to get defensive about this because right. that would like <laughs> totally <laughs> ruin the point of my talk. So, um, and would you say he's a skeptic as well? And it depends on who you ask. Uh, some people do the like three books, three stages argument, right? That he starts out kind of uh, stoic, then he goes through a skeptical phase, circa something like Raymond Sibon. And then by the end, he becomes a kind of Epicurean, a kind of cheery. Uh, you know, someone who's, uh, a, a, as Starobinsky says, right, has accepted mm -hmm. the world of appearances as such, right, and, and is no longer railing at it for being, like, false or ephemeral, right? Sometimes your tooth just falls out, right? Um, I don't think he ever totally drops the skepticism. I really don't. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but he does still have a god. <laughs> <laughs> and he does, right? Like, he does believe there are some things that are true, right? It's just hard for us to find them because our heads are firmly lodged up our own posterior, right? Well, I think he can be an epistemological relativist when it comes in terms of knowledge about certain things. But yeah. there's, I think there's certain ethical principles. Absolutely. Right? Which, yeah. in fact, when it comes to those ethical principles, he's not a relativist. Yeah. And no, one is again, you know, one is I think his whole phenomenology and the cultivation of the self and the education mm -hmm. of the self, and being you know really true to oneself to overcome self-deception. Mm -hmm. So if you hold that position, mm -hmm. then it's not in fact I think a relativist, the relativist the way people often think about relativism. Or yeah, skepticism. see, this is the thing I'd want to rehab and finesse relativism yeah. a little, right? Because I do think that uh, you know one of the things that I do find charming about Montaigne is his kind of, with the exception of, you know, Catholicism and a few ethical principles, his kind of aversion to dogma, right? As a kind of easy way out or as just less interesting than, you know, thinking about others or thinking about other styles of life, right? right. Or thinking about our own, right, self-fashioning, mm -hmm. but yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you.